1 Samuel 1. Okay, we'll start in verse 4. When the day came, Elkanah sacrificed, he gave portions to Peninnah, his wife, and all her sons and her daughters. But Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved Hannah, but the Lord closed her womb. Now her rivalry provoked greatly, making her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah her husband said to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon the seat by post of the temple of the Lord. And she was bitterness, was in bitterness of her soul, prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow unto, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on my affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but wilt give unto the handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of the life, and there shall no razor come on his head. Okay, we're going to skip down. In verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time had come, after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And when Elkna and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord a yearly sacrifice, and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and, abide, and there abide forever. And Elkna her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou hast weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave him, gave her son suck until he weaned, she weaned him. And when she weaned him, she took him up with her and three bullocks and one inch of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli and said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the child that stood up by thee, praying unto the Lord. For the child, for this child prayest, and I, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall lent to the Lord as he worshipped. So she realized that the Lord gave her her son. And she gave them back to the Lord as she promised. The best thing to do as a parent, as a mother, is to bring up the children in the house of the Lord. There's no better service that a parent can do than raise them up in Christ in the church. And she knew that she had to keep her vow. Cause, and the Lord ended up using Samuel. He became a prophet. He anointed two of the king, first king, two first kings of Israel. And God blessed her because of her faith. And we see um, in the, how they would come back for the sacrifice and how she'd bring something to Samuel, a little cloak each year. She didn't give them up because she didn't care for them. She knew that it was what God... She promised God and it was best to her keep that promise. And she trusted Him to the Lord. And the best thing a parent can do is trust their child to the Lord. This doesn't mean they don't care. It means that they know that the Lord is so much more in control than they could be. Okay, we're going to go to Exodus 1 now. No, Exodus 2, I'm sorry.
And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to a wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when he, she saw him that was a, go, a goodly child, she hid him three months. So what's going on here is uh, uh, Egypt is afraid because of the numbers of Israel. So they're putting away all the male children. And so rather than have her child put away, she's hiding him. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him an ark of rush, bulrushes and dabbed in it, it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and laid it in the flags of the river brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and the maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is the one of the Hebrew children. Then she said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child of thee? The Pharaoh's daughter said, Go, said to her, Go, and the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take the child away and nurse it for me, and I'll give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called his name Moses, and he drew him out of the water, because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went up, went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and spied the Egyptians, smiting one of his brethren. So we see how she spares him, a mother's love. And she ends up sparing him from doing this. And we uh, know that Moses is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Giving God using him to give the law. Because his mother's love caused him to be hidden and to spare him. If she wouldn't have did this, then the law wouldn't have been given. So we see how God uses a mother here for his plan. Moses would pin down the first five books of the Bible, the law, the core of the Old Testament. What the people of faith would live by until Christ died on the cross. Very significant. You know, she did everything she could to spare him rather than drown him in the river as they were commanded. She put him in a little basket and let it drift down the river and trusted it to the Lord. Okay, we're going to John 2 now. And the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. He saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto his servants, Whatsoever saith unto you, do it. He saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner purifying the Jews, containing two or three fur skins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they were filled to the brim. So we see how Jesus' mother helps him start his ministry. Because this is the first miracle he ends up performing. And it's his mother who asks him. This is most likely depicting because of the next chapter before Jesus is even baptized. Before John even announces, this is the one I've been preaching of. 
you know, a good and godly mother will help us point us in direction to service the Lord. Regardless of what service that may be, godly mother will be encouragement in that. When we think we can't, she's going to encourage us to do it and trust in the Lord. You know, oftentimes this world's going to knock us down. And a godly mother will always be there to point us back to the Lord so he can bring us up. Okay. Now we're going to go to Ruth 1. And this will be the last piece of scripture. Now it came to pass when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man Elkanah and his wife Naomi, and the, man, the name of the two sons Mahlon and Chilon, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came to the country of Moab and continued there. And Elmet Elamech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Ephrah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilon died, both of them, and the women, woman was left, and her two sons and her husband. Then she arose and her daughter-in-law, and she might return to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughter and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her daughters-in-law, Go, return to each of her mother's house. The Lord dealt kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. They ki then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said to, unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that I may ha be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should, I would hope if I should have a husband also that night, and should bear, also bear sons. Would you tarry for them till they are, were grown? Would you, you stay for them? from having husbands. Nay, my daughters, for it giveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Ophir kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth, Ruth cleaved unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister is, long, uh, is gone back into the people, unto her gods. Return thou after the sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. So we see, while she's just a daughter-in-law, not an actual daughter, but Naomi, the influence, ended up bringing Ruth to faith. There's nothing greater than be able to be an influence to bring somebody to the Lord. And sometimes just living a life and being in contact with people simply will cause us to be that influence. And that's what we're to do as Christians. We're to do whatever we can. But we're all supposed to look to the godly influence. Because while we're going to influence people, 
we're often in, going to be influenced by people. We should always make sure the people we're influenced by are the godly ones.